So tonight we start numbers. And this Bamidba. is Bar. Hey, Bamidba. Hooray. Bamidba. Is that what it says? This is like this is like a favorite in the sense to me, like of the uh the whole image of you know enduring the nothingness of the wilderness to get from where you are to a better place. And to, if you're not sure where you're going, within the nothingness you find your direction, you know? I love it. I love it. You find your Torah in the nothingness. Bamid Bar. Bamid Bar. In the wilderness. Wow, so this is interesting. So it has a census. So the yeah, the first thing we do is we start off with the census. And this is um it gets a little repetitive here with numbers in the tribes and whatnot. So is it okay if we kind of skip through a I want to say the numbers and I want to say the tribes, but I think the, the verbiage is like repetitive quite a bit. Let's look at this though. Oh, Monique is just coming in. She hasn't missed oh, the thing. Great. She's not that late. That's great. <laughs> Monique. Hey, Monique. Let's give a big underground tour. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to Monique. Is she there? Come on down. Monique. Hi. Hi, Monique. Hi, Hi Monique. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hey. So we're starting numbers. And, um, let me see. How about uh, Cynthia? Are you still with us? Is Cynthia... Yes, I'm here. Oh, you're here. Let's go. So let me see if we can start with, yeah, numbers 1-1. One, one. You want me to read? Yes, please, yeah, Cynthia. Yeah. On the first day of the second month in the second year following the exodus from the land of Egypt, the Eternal One spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting, saying, Take a census of the whole Israelite company of fighters by the clans of its ancestral houses, listing the names, every male, head by head. You and Aaron shall record them by their groups from the age of 20 years up. All those in Israel who are able to bear arms associated with you shall be a representative of each tribe, each one the head of his ancestral house. These are the names of the representatives who shall assist you. From Reuben, Elias, Elazar, son of Shadur, from Simeon, Shal Yumiel, son of Zer Shaddai, from Judah, Nashon, son of Amidabab, from Issachar, Is Is Nathaniel, son of Zuar, from Zebulon, Eliab, son of Helon, from the sons of Joseph, from Ephraim, Elishama, son of um, I hope I pronounced those correctly. If we can hold on in here for a minute. Under seven, from Judah, Nafshon. Do you say the word Nafshon? Yes. Does that, does that remind anybody anything about Nafshon? No. Yeah. You mean the whole Nafshon sewn up? Minadab? He's oh. the one who threw himself into the water first. Bingo. Okay, oh, so okay. Aha, aha, you, you, you got to explain that to everybody. Oh, I thought you were the one who was going to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please. All right. When we were standing uh, at the Sea of Reeds, the, the Red Sea, uh, and Moses says, let us cross, nobody, everybody was afraid and nobody did it. The one guy who did it, and then everybody followed him, was Nafshon. Oh, guy. I didn't know that. Huh. Yeah, but everybody, whenever you talk about him, you have to say Nachshon ben Aminadab. He's not just saying Nachshon. He is Nachshon ben Aminadab. That's how you refer to him. Yeah, so I, I understand. Jump into yeah. the water first. Yeah. Continuing on. Uh, from Manasseh, Gamaliel, son of Pedahzer. From Benjamin, Abidjan, son of Gideon. From Dan, Ahiazer, son of Amishadai. From Asher, Pagiel, son of Okrat. From God, Eliasaph, son of Duel. From Naphtali, Ahira, son of Enon. Those are the elected of the assembly, the chieftains of their ancestral tribes. They are the heads of the contingents of Israel. So Moses and Aaron took their representatives who were designated by name. And on the first day of the second month, they convoked the whole company of fighters who were registered by the clans of their ancestral houses, the names of those aged 20 years and over being listed head by head, as the Eternal had commanded Moses, 
so he recorded them in the wilderness of Sinai. They totaled as follows. The descendants of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, the registration of the clans of their ancestral house, as listed by name, head by head, all males aged 20 years and over, all who were able to bear arms, those enrolled from the tribe of Reuben, 46,500. Of the descendants of Simeon, the registration of the clans of their ancestral house, their enrollments as listed by name, head by head, all males aged 20 years and over, all who were able to bear arms, those enrolled from the tribe of Simeon, 59,300. Of the descendants of God, the registration of the clans of their ancestral house, as listed by name, aged 20 years and over, all who were able to bear arms, those enrolled from the tribe of God, 45,650. So this gets a little repetitive because it's the same wording uh, throughout all 12, I believe. But uh, if you do you want, if you want, we can just jump from the first name, like of yeah. the descendants of that, to the number at the end. So, like for twenty-six of the descendants of Judah, seventy-four thousand six hundred. Does that make sense? Is that yeah. Right? yeah, sure. That, that's good. Okay. How about how about continuing, Cynthia? Sh shall I go on? Of yeah. the descendants of the tribe of Judah, seventy-four thousand six hundred. Those enrolled from the tribe of Issachar, 54,400. Those enrolled from the tribe of Zebulon, 57,400. Of the descendants of Joseph, those enrolled from the tribe of Ephraim, 40,500. Those enrolled from the tribe of Manasseh, 32,200. Those enrolled from the tribe of Benjamin, 35,400. Those enrolled from the tribe of Dan, 62,700. Those enrolled from the tribe of Asher, 41,500. Those enrolled from the tide, tribe of Naphtali, 54,400. All who were enrolled came to 603,550. Wow, that's a huge number, isn't it? That's those, a lot of people. <laughs> you think there were that many really there? And it's like the first census, like, you know? Yeah. It is, it is like a census. census. You're right. Absolutely. It is like a census. Well, and, and, and actually, it is. It's, it's a little more interesting than that. This is a census of people who are ready to go to the army. This is yeah. a military census. This is not the census of everybody. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so this is the question. Yeah, they, they start with it's only males age 20 right. and above. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is somebody like 75 or 80? Because at this point, Moses and Aaron, they're over 80, right? At this point, are they are they I guess they would fight, too, right? Because Moses was the chief, right? I mean, I don't know. And then so you would imagine how many females and how many children under 20 or how many, you know, both male and female. That's you have to have like over a million people, right? Yeah, well, actually, as a, as a matter of fact, um, the the number that is given, given the number of males of military age, the total number is, uh, depending upon who you who you talk to, is between two and a half and three million. Hmm. Wow! Incredible. All right, who would like to read next? The Levites. We're going to get to I'll read. Thank you, read. Ruthie. Thank you, Cynthia, okay. too. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. That was a lot. The Levites, however, were not recorded among them by their ancestral tribe. For the Eternal had spoken to Moses, saying, Do not on any account enroll the tribe of Levi or take a census of them with the Israelites. You shall put the Levites in charge of the tabernacle of the pact all its furnishings and everything that pertains to it. They shall carry the tabernacle and all of its furnishings, and they shall tend it, and they shall camp around the tabernacle. When the tabernacle is to set out, the Levites shall take it down, and when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. Any outsider who enco encroaches shall be put to death. The Israelites shall encamp troop by troop, each man with his division and each under... his standard. The Levites, however, shall camp around the tabernacle of the pact 
that wrath may not strike the Israelite community. The Levites shall stand guard around the tabernacle of the pact. The Israelites did accordingly, just as the Eternal had commanded Moses, so they did. The Eternal One spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, The Israelites shall camp each man with his standard under the banners of their ancestral house. They shall camp around the tent of meeting at a distance. Camped on the front or east side, the standard of the division of Judah, troop by troop. Chieftain of the Judites, Nachshon, son of Amidadab, his troop is enrolled 74,600. Camping next to it, the tribe of Ishka, chieftain of the Ishkarites, Nathaniel, son of Zuar, his troop is enrolled 54,400. The tribe of Zebulun, chieftain of the Zebulunites, Eliab, son of Helon, his troop is enrolled 57,400. The total enrolled in the division of Judah, 186,400 for all troops. These shall march first. Okay. I'm just wondering, what? why is Judah and Issachar, are those connected? Are those tied together? Do we, are, Michael, there's three of them. I, Michael, I see oh. Judah, but where do you see Issachar? Issachar. Oh, so it's, it's three. Okay, so I guess for four sides, right? So we have 12 tribes. Each yeah. tribe is going to be on the four sides of the tent of meeting. Correct. So, so there's going to be three on one side, three on the next, three on the next. So these are the first side of the tent. That's where they're going to camp. Right. On one side. So I get it. I'm just putting it together in my head. I need one of those great uh, illustrations that you sometimes bring up, Dr. Mike. You know, <laughs> and uh, the standard, right? That's, um, is it just, uh, it's a, a flag, right? That's what I'm flag. thinking, right? right? A standard yeah. and banners. Um, okay, great. All right. Dr. Mike, didn't you talk about that before, like the colors of the robe and stuff, like the different families? Oh, yeah. Like it talks about here, like the flag, like their their robes, like they would wear certain colors, like of... Yes, each, each one of them. You, you, you know, the way I always thought about it is that, uh, let's say that you have 12 tribes. Well, imagine that you have 12 baseball teams. And each one of them has a different uniform. And by just watching the colors and how they present themselves, you know who belongs to which baseball team. Right. It's a good analogy. <laughs> Interesting. You want to continue, Ruth? Oh, sure. Um, on the south, the standard of the division of Reuben, troop by troop, chieftain of the Reubenites, Eliezer, son of Shadur, his troop is enrolled 46,500. Camping next to it, the tribe of Simon, chieftain of the Simonites. Shalomiel, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Just had to say that. Um, Shalomiel, son of Azur Shaddai, his troop is enrolled 59,300. And the tribe of God, Chieftain of the Gadites, Elisaf, son of Ruel, his troop is enrolled 45,650. The total enrolled in the division of Reuben, 151,450 for all troops, these shall march second. Then, midway between the divisions, the tent of meeting, the division of the Levites shall move as they camp, so they shall march, each in position by their standards. On the west, the standard of the division of Ephraim, troop by troop, chieftain of the Eph Ephraimites, Elishama, son of Amahad, his troop is enrolled 40,500. Next to it, the tribe of Manasseh, chieftain of the Manassites, Gam Gamaliel, son of Padazur, his troop is enrolled 32,200. And the tribe of Benjamin, Chieftain of the Benjamin Knights, Abedin, son of Gideoni, his troop is enrolled 35,400. The total enrolled in the division of Ephraim, 108,100 for all troops. These shall march third. Just before we go on, he just says it's the, the tribe of Ephraim, but all these people are not only from Ephraim, there's Benjamin. Why does he say that they're from Ephraim? 
Ephraim. Ephraim, I'm sorry, right. Why do um, they say? Well, um, the, 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 this is something that I think that we need, we need to point out. When they were there, you know, when they were encamped, it was one yeah. thing, they went marching. The way that this thing says in here is that the tribe of Judah and their helpers were the first one. Were the first, you know, the ones in the front of the, uh, of the, of the column. Right. Okay. Uh, then uh, I forgot which one of the, was was the second. Reuben. Reuben uh, was second. Reuben, thank you. Reuben is the second, and Ephraim and their um, uh, compatriots mm -hmm. uh, close to them was number three, and like this. So and so so what happened is, if you remember, is that uh, all of the tribes, you know, were, were going like Indian file, you know, one yeah. to the other one. And a mistake that they made is that they took all of the old people and the women and the children, and they were out in the back. And remember that the Amalekites, when they um, um, were fighting, when, when they um, fought the Israelites, they fought the people from the back. Uh -huh. remember that oh, so they killed all the children and, and women. Well, not, not, not all, but, you know, when they attacked, rather than attacking the strong troops in the front, uh -huh. they went after the old men, the women. Oh, and that's the terrible. And apparently they so you know, the Amalekites. And so, you know, this was so. Um, and, and it was because of this that, uh, you know, they set up like, like a number of troops and each one um was getting weaker as you went towards the back and I that's see. what the amalekites actually struck right i, I can i got it yeah so they lead with judah because judah is the lion right yeah correct the lion of judah yeah and uh, that's where david's from too right yeah. the the house of judah the house of judah but what what was it was the significance why because Judah also did something in Genesis right that he uh, he helped uh, reconcile Joseph a little bit or he offered himself he, right he offered himself in place of Benjamin okay and, and I think that this is something that everybody knows but after uh, you know the division um, you know of the uh, of Israel in in the north and Judah in the south, remember there was Judah and Benjamin. So, you know, first we had the monarchy and then the divided monarchy. Right. Well, from the word Judah, we get the word Jewish. Judaism, yeah. Oh, and Yehuda, Yehuda. Judaism, very interesting. Yehuda. Yeah, it's Judaism. Yeah. Judaism. <laughs> Judaism. <laughs> Okay, so should I continue or not? Yeah, sure. You okay, great. All right. On the north, the standard of the division of Don, troop by troop, she, she chief of the Danonites, uh, he's a son of Ami Shaddai, his troop is enrolled 62,700. Can I ask you, you know, these names, I was wondering if these names were easier for them to pronounce because it was part of their language, and this is not the type of Hebrew that was the original Hebrew. I mean, it is the original Hebrew, meaning that it's a different type of Hebrew. Is that the reason why it's so difficult to pronounce these? It's not difficult if you read it in Hebrew. If you read okay, the Hebrew, no. it's not difficult. Yeah, well, no, but I'm saying... You're reading transliteration. Okay, I'm reading... Read okay, I'm reading... But, it can, but when I've read it, some of these... Okay, maybe. All right. It just seemed like some of these... I, I always notice that. Like when I read, I can never read it in English. Like when I read Torah, I yeah. can never read it in English. But when I read it the it's, Hebrew... Yeah, it's, it's very hard to read in English. No, yeah, it really yeah, is. But yeah, but it's easy in Hebrew, though. It's, it's, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're yeah. right. Okay, so here we are. Should we roll? Okay, here we are. Camping next to it, the tribe of Asher, chieftain of the Asherites, Pagiel, son of Okran, his troop is enrolled 41,500. In the tribe of Naphtali, chieftain of the Naphtali lights, a hero son of Enan, his troop has enrolled 53,400. The total enrolled in the division of Don, 157,600, these shall march last by their standards. 
Those are the enrollments of the Israelites by ancestral houses. The total enrolled in the divisions for all troops, 603,550. The Levites, however, were not recorded among the Israelites as the Eternal had commanded Moses. The Israelites did accordingly, just as the Eternal had commanded Moses. So they camped by their standards, and so they marched each man with his clan according to his ancestral house. This is the line of Aaron and Moses at the time that the Eternal spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. These were the names of Aaron's sons, Nadad, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ith Ithamar. Those were the names of Aaron's sons, the anointed priests who were ordained for priesthood. But Nadab and Abihu died by the will of the Eternal when they offered alien fire before the Eternal in the wilderness of Sinai, and they left no sons. So it was Eliezer and Ithamar who served as priests in the lifetime of their father Aaron. So oh, wait, okay. why did wait a minute? Why did they die? What did they do with the? What was they, the okay, you right out. Uh, you remember that saying, we actually uh, talked about this thing, you know, back in the. Uh, in Levites, yeah. Okay, no, no, nobody really knows. Nobody really knows. But uh, they, it's, it said something that uh, apparently uh, those two sons, Nadab and Abihu, they made alien fire. Whatever that means, I don't know. Okay. They were bringing in some kind of uh, fire into the temple without permission. I see. And as a result of that, they died. And you remember that, uh, you know, when we were discussing this thing, you know, back in the uh, book of Levites, uh, in Leviticus, uh, remember that said that um, um, Aaron was totally silent? Yeah. yeah. Could I say something to Yeah, you? yeah, Gary, go for it. I, I, I've said this before, too, because... Um, they did this like right after the priest had given the instruction. The, it was right after, I think it was on the eighth day, yeah. when they were given the instructions in the Prasha Shemini. Um, and they had given the specific instructions, and when they given the instructions to make the incense that's supposed to be burned, it's very specific, and it's so holy, like nobody, it's not supposed to be used for any other purpose or anything. And then it's like right after being given these specific instructions, whatever that alien fire was, it was something that they just did on their own. And they didn't do it as priests representing the people. They just did it as something themselves, which wasn't their function. Like, in other words, they had just been given the specific instructions of what they were supposed to do as priests. And right out of the box, they, they deviated. I see. That's, I, think, that's just... I think what I learned from this whole thing is that there was no, there was no, um, any flexibility or space for deviation for what was what was required in, in in the way we built the tabernacle, in the way that we we did with the sacrifices. Everything was specifically right to the letter of the word. Right. Right. So and that's, that's a, what we. Yeah. And that's how, like, I know Doctor Ed is is really fond of saying, like. Because everyone's a barbarian, it felt like they yeah, needed right. to have that that extra right. rules. But Here's that the rule to me, book. yeah, but that to me is fascinating because they had that barbarian type of living. Mm -hmm. To think that they could follow all these rules—that's what always amazed me. To follow all those rules, and they had, they had to measure everything for the tabernacle and everything. To me, that seemed like you had to be a mathematician to do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And they're that's in the desert. So many. That's why so many Jews are accountants. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and and Ruthie, you know, you you asked a very good question. You know, why are some of these names, you know, so foreign? You know, yeah. from from Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I the the way that I heard it in the past, because you know people have asked that type of question before, and the answer that I heard uh, from one of the rabbis. Uh, is that uh, we were, at this particular point in time, we were not speaking Hebrew. We were speaking Aramaic. 
Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, that's true. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. these are essentially these are Aramaic. Aramaic. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. That this was not the language of just Hebrew. It was Aramaic, which is which which is different. I know it's similar, but it yeah. was different, and that's the reason why these these names seem kind of weird. Even in the Hebrew, uh, Gary. They're not exactly the type of Hebrew names that you. No, no, I'm not, not. I'm not. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, as far as reading them and pronouncing them, in oh, the I Hebrew, see. it's. I you know see. What I'm like it's it's easier than the transliteration. I get it. I understand. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, so, so they I still see. sound like as you know foreign. Yeah. yeah. It's just that it's easier to read them. You know. You know. Just like um, Yiddish uh, is a German. Um, uh, part of the German language, you know, uh, uh, low German, but it is written with Hebrew letters. I yes, and it has a little bit of Hebrew mixed in, too. Yeah, Hebrew, and Hebrew also, some Hebrew, but it's written in Hebrew, you know, Hebrew character. Right. right. Okay. Well, I think that what we're seeing in here in the Bible is that these are Aramaic names written in Hebrew, in Hebrew letters. I it's see, almost I like see. the Hebrew transliteration. The right, Hebrew right, is right, right, right. That's it. Right. Yeah, because it's exactly the same. It sounds exactly yeah. the same, right? Right. Yeah. Thanks, Ruth, so much. Do you uh does Do you want me to finish this little thing here? No. Or I thought we I think we had it. I think we had it. Right? Oh, we're done? No. Or no, no, I thought I thought you went down to No, I don't think I have. Uh, I didn't I what where did I stop at 34? Three. No, I thought. All right, go ahead. I thought you went all the way to the end. But oh, did I go to the, all the way? Maybe I did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I don't think I did. Okay, go uh, for it. Go for let it. Let me. Okay, the Israelites did accordingly, just as the Eternal commanded Moses. So they camped by the sands, and so they march each man with his clan. That that part I read. This okay. is the part I didn't read. This is the line of Aaron and Moses at the time that the Eternal spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. These were the names of Aaron's sons: Nadad, the firstborn, and Abba. Abihu. Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithmama. Those were the names of Aaron's sons. The anointed priests were ordained for priesthood. But Nadad and Abihu died by the will of... Oh, you're right. I did read this. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. I'm sorry. I think I'm losing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's okay. always nice to, to read it again. And, oh. uh, and a long time ago, I asked one of my rabbis, since there are two sons either Eliezer or Ithamar. Yeah. Um, since I am a Cohen, which one was it? Was it, am I a descendant of Eliezer or Ithamar? And according to all the rabbis, all the present day Cohens like me are the descendants of Eliezer. I was just about to say that even though I didn't know that because I never heard of Ithamar. I only heard of Eliezer. That's interesting. Eliezer, huh? Yeah. But you got your great 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 grandfather's look. You said it better than me. I bet if you saw a picture of Aaron, if they had photographs at the time, they'd say Dr. Mike looks just like his great 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 grandfather. That's funny. Who wants to read next? I'm looking for volunteers. Any volunteers out in the audience tonight? I will. I will. All right, Gary. I love it. Where are we reading? We're, uh, oh, we're number, up here, number five. Oh, okay. Gary's. By the bear, I don't know you all, Moshe Lemoore. Oh, I'm sorry. You want it in English. Right here. there we go. The Eternal One spoke to Moses, saying, Advance the tribe of Levi and place its men in attendance upon Aaron, the priest, to serve him. They shall perform duties for him and for the whole community before the tent of meeting, doing the work of the tabernacle. They shall take charge of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, a duty on behalf of the Israelites, doing the work of the tabernacle. You shall assign the Levites to Aaron and to his sons. They are formally assigned to him from among the Israelites. You shall make Aaron and his sons responsible for observing their priestly duties, and any outsider who encroaches shall be put to death. The Eternal One spoke to Moses, saying, I hereby take the Levites from among the Israelites in place of all the male firstborn, the first issue of the womb among the Israelites. The Levites shall be mine, for every male firstborn is mine. At the time that I smote every male firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated every male firstborn in Israel 
human and beast, to myself, to be mine the Eternals. The Eternal One spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, Record the descendants of Levi by ancestral house and by clan. Record every male among them from the age of one month up. So Moses recorded them at the command of the Eternal as he was bidden. These were the sons of Levi by name, Gershon, Kohach, and Merari. These were the names of the sons of Gershon by clan, Libni and Shimei. The sons of Kohath by clan, Amram and Izha, Hebron and Usiel. The sons of Merari by clan, Mali and Mushi. These were the clans of the Levites within their ancestral houses. To Gershon belonged the clan of the Lib Libnites and the clan of the Shemites, those who were the clans of the Gershonites. The recorded entries of all their males from the age of one month up, as recorded, came to 7,500. The clans of the Gershonites were to camp behind the tabernacle to the west. The chieftain of the ancestral house of the Gershonites was Elisaph, son of Lael. The duties of the Gershonites in the tent of meeting comprised the tabernacle, the tent, its covering, and the screen for the entrance of the tent of meeting. The hangings of the enclosure, the screen for the entrance of the enclosure, which surrounds the tabernacle, the cords thereof, and the altar. All the service connected with these. To Kohath belonged the clan of the Amorites, the clan of the Issarites, the clan of the Hebronites, and the clan of the Uzelites. Those were the clans of the Kohathites. All of the listed males from the age of one month up came to 8,600, attending to the duties of the sanctuary. The clans of the Kohathites were to camp along the south side of the tabernacle. The chieftain of the ancestral house of the Kohathite clans was Elisaphan, the son of Uziel. Their duties comprised the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, and the sacred utensils that were used with them and the screen, all the service connected with these. The head chieftain of the Levites was Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, in charge of those attending to the duties of the sanctuary. To Merari belonged the clan of the Mahalites and the clan of the Mushites. Those were the clans of Merari. They recorded entries of all their males from the age of one month up, came to 6,200. The chieftain of the ancestral house of the clans of Merari was Zuriel, son of Abihel. They were to camp along the north side of the tabernacle. The assigned duties of the Merarites comprised the planks of the tabernacle, its bars, posts, and sockets, and all its furnishings, all the service connected with these, also the posts around the enclosure, and their sockets, pegs, and cords. Wow. What do you think of this, that we have all these detailed... Like Ruthie was saying, the details of all these things. Yet, yet we didn't hear one detail about the fighters. Like, you know, this is a sword. This is how you kill somebody. <laughs> I think they already had that, right? <laughs> they must have known that already. Right. right. But it's so interesting. The the like you, like Ruthie was pointing out, just all the different, all know. the details of all now the stuff. You, like now this. you know why it's called and, numbers. <laughs> but the but but these details, like the details of the sanctuary the details of the priestly garments yeah it's yeah. all like so incredible how detailed and how it was recorded yeah and how there's important no, yeah go ahead Brock. there's no mention of any women I know. well that's because it was a, it was a very uh uh male dominated society at that time yeah no no women at all no girls no women well that's because the the women were not part of of, of warriors in those days this right. is they're talking about they're going to be going into battle. And so the women were not part of being a warrior. Okay, I see. But Miriam had a had some role, didn't she? Somewhat in in surrounding Well, she her role was to get the water. Miriam's role was getting the water through the desert. She she found wells or something. I don't know how or it's miraculously found wells. I don't know ever understood that completely, but that was her job was getting the water. She also did the music with the women. Oh yeah, but that was but yeah, they, they used to yeah, they used to sing 
I mean, they celebrated and the tambourines. Women would, yeah, with the tambourines. Yes, they did sing and, and dance and everything, but they were not part of the warriors. You know, I'm just saying, being you know in battle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The other thing too, um, I read this one time a long time ago, um, when uh, bringing it sort of closer to home, but it was like George Washington. We all know who he is, right? He um, he was camped at Valley Forge in the winter, I think it was seven, 1777. And it was a real turning point because everyone thought George Washington was a little nuts um, because he also had a lot of defeats in the army and, and they camped out in, in uh, Valley Forge in the winter. And he would write letters to the Continental Congress like almost daily. He just wrote tracks and tracks of letters. And one, one time he came across, he realized he didn't have a chaplain in his camp. He didn't have a, a priest or a chaplain. And he wrote this huge diatribe, like, I, I can't do, you know, we, it's like not giving us bullets. How can we not have a chaplain here? You know, it was like so important for Washington. Because why? Because he was reading these, these stories and he realized that this is how you, this is how you, you have to establish oneself. You know, if you're going to establish something for God, this is kind of how it works, you know? I think anyway, that's my opinion. Just my opinion. Ma 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 Michael, uh, I, I think that an interesting point, uh, George Washington, as well as all of our founding fathers, back in those days, they knew so much Bible that today they would have been considered to be Bible scholars. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. They, they studied the Bible just like, Absolutely. you know, you would study other things in life, right? And Mike, you're going to be interested in two more weeks or three more. Uh, it's going to be on uh, May, Tuesday, May the 25th. <clears throat> I'm going to be giving an extended version uh, here at a temple te called Temple Menorah. I'm going to be giving a Zoom, and the title is going to be Jewish Influences in the American Constitution. Oh yeah, that's you know who knows a lot about that. Uh, Mike is um, is um, B Bill Gordon. Bill knows I a lot about. It. You know, he's a lawyer. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, he knows a lot about. That's that. awesome. That's that because yeah. you did that with. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I did it with your group. Yes, exactly. That and that was fun. That was a lot. That was amazing stuff. So I'd love to drop in on an that. Expanded version of that. Yeah, that'd be fun. That'd be really. Right. All right, Gary, you want to continue, Gary? Is years? any okay. of this actually written? I, I can't imagine that there are scholars reading this. It's not written yet, is it? Oh. What you, well, what's not written yet? What are you talking about? No, no, okay. Dur during the American Revolution, uh, you know, the Bibles were, especially the King James Version, it was available to everybody, but these, it was only before the printing press. But, the, but these guys, no, no, they, this is after the printing press. The printing yeah, press was in the 1400s. Um, uh, the founding fathers knew so much Hebrew that they were writing, they were reading the Bible in Hebrew. Well, that I didn't right. know. Yeah. What? Well, Even the Christians were reading it in Hebrew? absolutely and in doesn't fact, william bradford governor william bradford's headstone have hebrew yeah. writing on it well yeah. and in fact michael you remember that uh, you know i showed the um the emblems uh, of uh, two colleges that's well, right this expanded uh, you know one of them was yale mm -hmm. um well i i am you know in this presentation i'm going to give five seals of five universities containing hebrew letters mm when they Incredible. were formed in the 16 and 1700s in the United States. Interesting. But they, they did have the King James Bible did come out in the early 1600s. I forget right. exactly when right. it was like 16. Right. And here wow. we're talking about in the 1700s. Right. And but when was the printing press uh, started? The 1500s. Well, the printing press, but it, it, the Gutenberg did it in 1480. And Gutenberg was Jewish. No. German. No? Oh, oh, no, German. Oh. In, in what, what happens, what happens is, is that, um, you know, we adopted many of the German names. I understand that. No, so I understand. Gutenberg could have very easily have been Jewish, but it is really German. Yeah, I understand. I understand. That. Were you going to add something, Bracca? I thought I heard something. No, I just said 15th century. Yeah. 
Yeah, 1400s. Yeah, 1480. Yeah, 1480. That's the 15th century. The the end of the 15th century. And the other thing, I mean, just as we're talking about the Bible, so we're talking about the Bible a little bit. The um, I have also heard when the African Americans were um, given the given the uh, ability or given the option, like or opportunity to to learn how to read. That was one of those things. And they really wanted to learn how to read. And the biggest reason was they wanted to read the Bible on their own. They didn't want anyone to tell them what it was in the Bible. They wanted to read it for themselves. And so it's a big, a big deal. I mean, you just see that this book goes through so much of our, of, of our collective history. It's so amazing. Hallelujah. Gary, Aki. Yes. <laughs> what, what number? We're at, we're at 33, 38, right? I think 38. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Okay, those who were to camp before the tabernacle in front, before the tent of meeting on the east, were Moses and Aaron and his sons, attending to the duties of the sanctuary, as a duty on behalf of the Israelites, and any outsider who encroached was to be put to death. All the Levites who were recorded, whom at the Eternal's command Moses and Aaron recorded by their clans, all the males from the age of one month up came to 22,000. The Eternal One said to Moses, Record every firstborn male of the Israelite people from the age of one month up, and make a list of their names, and take the Levites for me, the Eternal, in place of every male firstborn among the Israelite people, and the cattle of the Levites in place of every male firstborn among the cattle of the Israelites. So Moses recorded all the male firstborn among the Israelites as the Eternal had commanded him. All the firstborn males, as listed by name, recorded from the age of one month up, came to 22,273. The Eternal One spoke to Moses, saying, Take the Levites in place of all the male firstborn among the Israelite people, and the cattle of the Levites in place of their cattle, and the Levites shall be mine, the Eternals. And as the redemption price of the 273 Israelite male firstborn over and above the number of the Levites, take five shekels per head. Take this by the sanctuary weight, 20 gras to the shekel, and give the money to Aaron and his sons as the redemption price for those who are in excess. So Moses took the redemption money from those over and above the ones redeemed by the Levites. He took the money from the male firstborn of the Israelites 1,365 sanctuary shekels. And Moses gave the redemption money to Aaron and his sons. Actually, can I can I ask a question? Because I don't understand what's going on here. Is there, is, if this is what, the dedication of the firstborn males? How does this work exactly? Well, as far as, far as I know, you know, even though they are uh, mixing it with the Levites and this, that, and the other thing, you remember that the firstborn males, not, not just in the desert, but eventually, uh, you know, when we were already in Canaan, the firstborn males were always the most important of them all because uh, the inheritance of the family always went to the firstborn males. All right. So in this particular case, imagine that you're in the desert, you've got a whole bunch of clans and and uh, you know families and things. Uh, they expected that they were going to see enemies and they were going to be in battle. Well, it would be important for the families and for the community to find out who the firstborn males were in case that they were killed, what, what, what is gonna be the inheritance then of the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you put all of that together, I think that this is why they're making such a big deal about it. And, and, and Michael, there's another thing that I thought about as we were, you know, going through this particular last paragraph. You know, the, the miracle that uh, a language, Hebrew, uh, that had essentially remained dormant for 2,000 years, uh, it became uh, a living language again, you know, in the early 1920s and uh, in, in 19, 19 and 1920s. But amazingly enough, when the state of Israel was formed, first they took the name from Israel, that's number one, and number two is the currency, they also called it the shekel. 
Right. That I do know, yeah. That's excellent. Yeah, it's, all, it's amazing. All, all, all of that is completely biblical. It's true. Yeah. That's true. And there was a guy that was a Holocaust survivor named Joseph Bao. And he, he was a fine artist, and he was also a, a filmmaker and a lot of other things. And he survived the Holocaust. He went to Israel, and they employed him to come up with the characters, the Hebrew characters, because it wasn't in use, and they needed typeset. They needed all these things. So Joseph Bao, he, had, he wrote a book. He wrote several books, actually. He's, How do you spell that? B-A-U? B-A-U, yeah, B-A-U. I had this book. It's incredible. We went to uh, when we went to the when we went on the tour. We went to the museum, which was run by his daughter, and it was absolutely a, incredible to be in his workshop. He only had like a little one room workshop. He would do uh, animation. He would do uh, you know his his graphics. Fascinating guy. If I had the book, I don't know where it went. Awesome. Next downstairs. next week I'll bring it up next week, but it's okay. really amazing. It's, he talks all about the horrors of the Holocaust, and whew, was a tough one. Well, it was tough. There is the, there is a ceremony redemption of the firstborn, mm -hmm. even today, mm -hmm. when the firstborn is thirty. Yes, the Pinyin Aben, yeah. The Pinyin yeah. Aben, yeah. The Pinyin Aben, also five. Of five uh, silver coins that are used to redeem him. Right. That's amazing. Amazing. They keep, this day. That's great. Yeah. They keep the tradition going. Uh, actually, uh, Brock, I have a question for you. My husband was the second child, but he's the firstborn male. Would he have, would he have had a pigeon have been when he was born? I'm sure. He was the second? No, I said he's the second child, but the first male. Then, then he would have had it. He would have had it. That's what I, I don't know. know. Because so it doesn't have to do with which which child it is. No, it's just no, the no. first male. I don't it's know. The first male. Yeah. Right. I, don't, I don't know. I think the first child uh -huh. has to be a male, and it has it, it has to be natural birth, not no cesarean. No, no, no. That's I understand right. about the. Not, I'm just talking about that because he was the first male. His sister but it has was to be older. the first child, to my understanding. Oh, I thought it was the first, first male. child. Oh, so Michael, what what did you going to say about it? Well, you know, my, my understanding was is that um, let let's say that you have a family with five children. Yeah. yeah. First four are women, a yeah. girl. The fifth, being the firstborn male, is a firstborn male. Now there's a special he's one. Not the before. Now, it's a special super duper thing if the first child is also the first born male. Yeah, okay. So he doesn't oh, no. get a, what I'm saying is my husband wouldn't have gotten a pidgin of Ben when he was born because he was the second child. Is that right, yeah. Brahma? Yeah. So, so, so he was not the Bahor. The Bahor is the first male. It's the Bahor. Right. But he wouldn't have had a pidgin of Ben, right? No, I don't think so. Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out. Okay, I just trying to figure out. Four is the oldest and it, the male. It's the first one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll get it. Okay. To my Excellent. Several firstborn males. Um, does anyone want to pick up where Gary left off? Thank you, Lachi, for reading. Yay. Thank you. I can do what it. What was that? I think we lost Danny somehow. Or, oh, Braca. How about Braca? Yeah, if you want. Yes. You have my reading glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we start? I uh, read it, well, at the Eternal's bidding, as the Eternal had commanded Moses. At the Eternal's Moses. bidding, as the Eternal had commanded Moses. Yeah. The yeah. Eternal One spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, take a separate census of the Kohathites among the Levites by the clans of their ancestral house from the age of 30 years up to the age of 50, all who are subject to service to perform tasks for the tent of meeting. This is the responsibility of the Kohathites in the tent of meeting, the most sacred objects. At the breaking of camp, Aaron and his sons shall go in and take down the screening curtain and cover the Ark of the Pact with it. 
they shall lay a covering of dolphin skin over it and spread a cloth of blue, of pure blue on top, and they shall put its poles in place. Over the table of display, they shall, they shall spread a blue cloth. They shall place upon it the bowls, the ladles, the jars, and the libation jugs, and the regular bread shall rest upon it. They shall spread over these a crimson cloth, which they shall cover with a covering of dolphin skin, and they shall put the pole, poles in place. Just this before you go on, wait, but just before you go on, where did they get dolphin skin in the desert? Right. I was wondering about that myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a in miracle. Another miracle. <laughs> Not a miracle. Yeah. Well, they and call in, him Flipper. Flipper. In, in, wait a second. in addition to that, <clears throat> they're talking about bringing animals. They're talking about the uh, bulls and, uh, you know, not, not just sheep. So yeah. there are no bulls in the, in the desert. <laughs> well, yeah. I thought they took some of the animals from Egypt, though, right? Well, but even if they did, it, they, they weren't going to last too long. If you've got three million people in the desert, yeah, but you know, they maybe but they could have had the animals, you know, mate with each other. I don't oh, know. I see. Wow. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know, know how that goes about. The but question it, for which I don't think anybody's got the answer. Okay, very interesting about the dolphin skin, though. <laughs> it was probably really shriveled up, I would imagine, in the desert. How could it be nice? I don't know. It's another miracle. All right, keep going, Bracca, please. Then they shall take a blue cloth and cover the lampstand for lighting with its lamps, its tongs, and its fire pans, as well as all the oil vessels that are used in its service. They shall put it and all its Furnish. furnishings into a covering of dolphin skin, which they shall then place on a carrying frame. Maybe the, the uh, dolphin skin really stands for something else. I, I don't know. A dolphin is a dolphin. I don't know. <laughs> Next, they shall spread a blue cloth over the altar of gold and cover it with a covering of dolphin skin, and they shall put its balls in place. They shall take all the service vessels with which the service in the sanctuary is performed, put them into a blue cloth, and cover them with a covering of dolphin skin, which they shall then place on a carrying frame. They shall remove the ashes from the copper altar and spread a purple cloth over it. Upon it, they shall place all the vessels that are used in this service, the fire pans, it is service, the fire pans, the flesh hooks, the scrapers in the basins, all the vessels of the altar, and over it they shall spread a covering of dolphin skin, and they shall put its poles in place. When Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sacred objects and all the furnishings of the sacred objects at the breaking of camp, only then shall the Kohathites come and lift them so that they do not come in contact with the sacred objects and die. These things in the tent of meeting shall be the, the porterage of the Kohathites. Responsibility shall rest with Eliezer, zone of Aaron, the priest, for the lighting oil, the aromatic incense, the regular meal offering, and the anointing oil, responsibility for the whole tabernacle and for everything consecrated that is in it or in, the, in its vessels. The Eternal One spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Do not let the group of Kohathites clans be cut off from the Levites. Do this with them, that they may live and not die when they approach the most sacred objects. Let Aaron and his sons go in and assign each of them to his duties and to his borderage. But let not the Kohathites go inside and witness the dismantling of the sanctuary, lest they die. Woo, I think we're done. Yes, we're that's done. A, that's, wow. a, that's a pretty heavy duty. Uh... Yeah, that was a tough one. A lot of, a lot of details. 
A lot of details. Well, right? I'm, I'm finding a lot of details in this tour in general, not just this fascia. Right. It's, it's amazing. It is amazing. I like Brock. Brock, I love what you thought of when you said maybe the dolphin skins mean something else. So there is. Yeah. 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 Well, you know I what? You can wait. There is a place to find out about that. That's what the Talmud's about. They okay. they do go, they do you know really delve into the in the Talmud they delve into this a lot of each yes. of what these all mean and yes. I used I took a Talmud course when I did you know the Mayer program from Hebrew College and it was fascinating and I loved it but I need to be with somebody who can help me with all the um, with all the interpretations because you know there's uh, Hillel has a, there's all these different you know rabbis that have that are very knowledgeable and they have lots of different opinions. So you have to be with somebody who's a Talmud scholar. My husband was, but I, that, I never really studied with him. I wish I did now, <laughs> but I, I did a little bit of the, of the, the, the Humish with him, but not the Talmud. Okay. This is what I find here. And in the, uh, the Torah that I read, the Humash that I read, there are, comments from the Talmud. It doesn't say exactly what the sources are, but the commentaries yeah. are always here together. So they're right. saying they're calling it a covering of skins of something tahash. Do we know what tahash is? I don't know. Okay. I don't know so if that's a dolphin or not. I don't know. Is it blue? It, tahash. You know what? It can be an animal that was then and it's not now. Oh, and, oh and, I see what you're and saying. What we're reading is just using the word uh, dolphin. Oh. But here it says a covering of skins. I'm translating because this is in Spanish. A covering of skins of Tahash. And Tahash is the original language. Oh. I have yes. that too in this. Uh, Safaria. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh -huh. I'm, mo I'm moving it over to the screen. This is, is that what right, you Right, that's the Tahash I'm talking tahash, about. Tahash, a wild beast. Oh, it's a wild beast, beast. And, and actually a dolphin is not a wild beast. Oh, it's kind of a friendly, it's a friendly mammal. And here again, I read here, skins, a covering of skins of Tahash. A kind of wild beast, yeah. That's what it says there. Okay, so where is that there? It's after Tahash. It says a, a kind of wild beast. And it was multicolored, too. I think that's the clue where people could could only think like, well, oh, it's like this dolphin skin. When the light hits it one way, it's like light, yeah. you know, it's like gray. And then if it's blue, it's You know, different. I'd love to speak to somebody so who it's said not it's well, they had it. Been. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. And so trans it delights and prides itself in its colors. Yeah. So it's a, it's probably very shiny or something. Wow. Well, thanks everyone. This, this was is... great. This was a really very insightful. Yeah. yeah. Ruth, you asked a question last week, and it was here that I found the answer. You said, why could they not sell residences that were within the world, in particular places in the world? in the world areas and yeah. it's because those are with holiness because it's from the time of the conquest by Yeshua ben Nun when they went into the promised land remember you asked and I oh yeah, yeah, know yeah, yeah. then okay oh, so my. I believe I sent it to Dr. Mike at 1 30 in the morning I saw that it. day because that's when I found wow. out I'm impressed and we you both have <laughs> we both looked at it, Dr. Mike. I wanted yeah, Dr. And, Mike to and, see and, it. Baca, I want you to know, I read it at 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay, wow. so that's Do you good. get any sleep at all, Mike? <laughs> well, you know, it made a big ding, so I had to read it. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Bracha, for taking the time to really look this up. And also, you might. No, it's, I, it's that you bring very interesting points up. <laughs> It's what it is. Yeah, very nice. I hope it's, I didn't wake up Dr. Mike when I sent that email. No, no. It, it, it made a ding, and I read it, and I went back to sleep. Oh, it wasn't it <laughs> Now I know you don't turn off your phone. 
Chris. No. We, 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 we saw it for a second, Mike. And then, and then it went away. Yeah. Ah, I hell. just saw it right there. Yeah. That's just Joseph uh, Ryan. This, But, you know, I want to mention to you, um, Mike Budo, that um, a lot of a lot of Holocaust survivors have fascinating stories um, because I've met many, many um, Holocaust survivors and every one of them has had incredible stories of, of mm -hmm. horror and how they escaped and everything. And um, I think I told you that um, I had, my granddaughter did a um, essay on a man that lived to almost 110 and his name was, um, oh my God, I can't think of his name now. Uh, oh. Anyways, he lived to almost, and he, he lived in my building in, in, in Revere, when I lived in Revere. Wow. And, and when he was 105, he told my granddaughter, who was only 16 at the time, what happened to him during the Holocaust. And he was thrown into Siberia, okay? Wow. And, and almost everybody that was thrown into Siberia died from the cold and everything because they didn't give him anything, no, you know, no shelter or anything. Mm -hmm. And some one nice neighbor that lived there took him in and saved his life. And it's an wow. incredible story. So I want you to know that um, I've met many, and every one of them has fascinating stories, not just, I mean, I'm sure this man has fascinating stories, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you, there's so many of them. It's, mm -hmm. If you ever go to the Holocaust Museum in the D.C., it'll blow your mind. It'll just blow yeah. your mind, you know. Yeah. You should go there if you really want it. It's, it's quite a, it's yeah, I'd, I'd love to read more. I mean, every account I read of someone who was in a camp, it just it just is so hurtful. It just pain yeah. you know, just to read through. But it's even because more it than just the kills. camps. There were so many. There were work camps. Yeah. There were people that were thrown into Siberia. There were people that were. Um, I, listen, I read a book on the children that survived uh, the Holocaust and how they were running through the woods and dodging uh, oh. being killed. And that book killed me more than any other and some Which of the book children is that? Were, I, I, I'm, 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 I love reading I mean I hate you and know the, and it's, it's some so of the children were as young as four years old that survived there Can is, you imagine being four years old and surviving um, the Holocaust there's a work by a psychologist that's only a few years old uh, her name is Dr. Egar and the book is called The Choice yeah and, and it's something relatively new on the Holocaust and just how our thoughts should be directed to to the now. People who went through that, how they make it out. Right. How they can continue. It's how they it, have to redirect our thoughts. Right. But that book on the children of the Holocaust, I got it at the Holocaust Museum um, in DC and I, I, I want you to know I started the book and I could not put it down. I slept. I, I read it the whole night. I never. I never stopped reading it. I oh. could not put it down. Yeah. Well, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Raka actually knows this right across the hall from me. There's a Holocaust survivor, right? Alex Gross, and he became uh, one of the biggest builders uh, in. Um, uh, um, you know, one, one of the cities, you know, down here in, in Florida, um, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta, right. Georgia. So he survived the Holocaust, came to the United States, actually did, he was so thankful that the United States had accepted him and given him a visa to come here. During the Korean War, he volunteered to go in the army and he, served in Korea. Mm -hmm. Then after he came out, became one of the biggest builders in Atlanta, Georgia. And he was one of the people that um, established the Holocaust Museum here in Miami Beach. You know Very him, nice. Alex. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, there's and so he, many, but there's so many of them. There's people like that in Boston that's, that built the Holocaust Museum here in Boston. What I'm saying is that you go all over the country. You go to California. You go everywhere, and you'll meet these Holocaust survivors all over the country. And the one thing that 
that, that they keep on saying no matter what is that you can never forget. And that's why they teach in the schools and everything. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. if you, they don't teach, because there's so many Holocaust deniers, that's the problem. There's Holocaust deniers and they're saying it never happened. And that's why these Holocaust survivors are dying now. Remember, I was born in 1945. I was named after my grandfather's sister who was killed in the Holocaust. So I was named after her because it was my grandfather's sister. And mm -hmm. I want you to know that most of these people that were like even children in the 40s and now, if I'm 75, I'm gonna be 76, and a lot of them are 80 and up, you know, so they're not gonna be- a Michael, what, what is this that you're showing us from uh, Joseph Bau? This is his uh, museum. I think this is the museum as you walk in his house. It's like I his know. house on the second or the first floor. So, so he, the museum is in his house? Right. Or, yeah, the house he rented. I don't even think they own the house. No, but they, they don't because the, uh, the landlord is evicting them because they're not. Oh, yeah, they were. They were uh, the, yeah, the rent was right. tricky. But the way he signed his name, if you see that S, it looks like an S with some lines underneath it. Yeah. If you take that and flip it sideways, it becomes the the bet in the um, Aleph and the U, I think, oh. something like that. So he wrote it like kind of. He was very fanciful, very uh, creative with the with the words. You notice how all the the, the script is all different. He's, he kind of made a graphic design. Well, actually, um, the, um, the 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 sign on the right. Is, is Hebrew script, not Hebrew writing, you know, print. All right, right. That's, Hebrew script. That's Hebrew yeah, script. That, that is yeah. That's Hebrew script. That's Hebrew script. That's Hebrew script. But low tov means not good. Yeah. So what, what, what is that? Well, he was. It, it must have been something to do with the hall. I mean, that's a museum. We don't know. Oh, because oh, 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 I see, I see. We don't know what it was about. We just, yeah. He's just showing us something that was in his house, you know. Yeah. yeah. yeah it says Joseph Bao, low tov. You can't read but under it. I would say that every single person you'll ever meet that's a Holocaust survivor will have something that will blow your socks off. Right. Every one of them. Yeah, every one of them. I believe yeah. it. Wow. Well, okay. as always, wonderful night. Well, this was a great, a great night as usual. We always learn, and we always have lots more to learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's always something else. Absolutely. Yeah. Always something else. All right. Thank well, you, you all have a good night. Monique, it's good to see you. Bless you all. Thank yeah. you. Good night.